we're it's the wealth starting at 2.30, uh, architect principles. My name is Michael Durso. I am the enterprise architect at LSE. I've been here for about two years, just under. And before that, I was with a healthcare company, Nuffield Health, for uh, all two years. And then I'm the BBC uh, for about 15 years in various different uh, various different guises. So firstly, working directly for the BBC and sourced by a and, and back to the BBC. So I have a mix of, I guess, private and public sector uh, experience. Um, so today's webinar. Uh, so let's move on. There we are. Um, so why why have a, uh, a webinar about architecture principles? I had a I had an email exchange with Ian Anderson, who organises the Enterprise Architecture uh, Community of Practice Group. And he was looking for, for, for subjects uh, for a webinar. I, and I suggested this mainly because I think that architecture principles are one of the, the basic building blocks of, of, of architecture in any organization. Um, they're one of the things to put in place and they're one of the most important things. Um, I think probably uh, um, it's working out that, that I I'm not trying to build myself as some kind of a, a sector wide expert in architecture principles. Uh, there may well be people coming in who know an awful lot more about it than me who have implemented and worked with architecture principles in more place. Um, uh, probably if you are in that category, you will probably won't learn quite much from, from this webinar uh, as people who have very little or, or no experience. Um, it may be useful for the, for the more expert people to, to cross-reference things, but I'm not, I'm not sitting here trying to say I some and may method of doing architecture principles that no one's thought of. It's more of a, of a, uh, of, of, of a look at and uh, uh, I think about architecture principles. Um, we're looking at architecture principles in a wider context, so the, uh, the what, the why, the how, rather than I'm not planning to go through the architecture principles that we have at the LSC in, in great detail. Um, I think the reasons for that will become apparent as we talk through. There's a lot of, tends to be a lot of commonality, um, those kinds of things. So in terms of, of actually what I'm going to talk about, um, first of all, looking at the definition of architecture principles, what, what are they? Um, thinking about why you'd actually have them in the first place, what's the point of them, what do you gain? Approach right them and then on to implementing and using them um, a subject in its own right which could be which could fill uh, a webinar with great ease and then just one or two disadvantages or, or potential pitfalls things to talk about then on to questions and answers or it may be if there are a lot of expert people on the call maybe in terms of, of comment clarifications and um, we should have uh, 20 25 minutes time for that at the end what are architecture principles? You can get a definition from TOGAF on the screen in front of you. I'm not going to read it out verbatim. The best sticks in my mind is that first line, really. Principles are general rules and guidelines intended to be enduring. So, so the two principles, I think, is, some, is it an enduring rule? Um, and that comes the principle. I think it's useful as that last, uh, the last part of the, of the last part of the second sentence. Um, about them forming the system for making future IT decisions. So, so that's that's generally how you use them. Um, probably on this call, there are some people who look at it. There are probably some people who hate it, and there are probably some people who who have no interest in it whatsoever. And um, it's to have uh, it's to quite a range of opinions. Um, as on principles, initially fairly strong. It, it has a chapter devoted to principles, and it's fairly clear and easy to understand. I can, in fact, use that standalone. If you don't buy into the rest of TOGAF, um, you can quite easily use the bit around principles, um, and it will still um, and make sense. Um, the enduring and seldom amended bit is important as well in terms of principles. Um, so that you, you should not be up, you wouldn't expect to be updating your principles every year, um, every six months. Um, we also were approved, um, I think, about 18 months ago, and we have made a couple of small wording changes and some clarifications, really. Nothing more major than that. We are our principle number 16 around cloud. Um, we've been doing quite a lot of thinking around cloud, um, and so we're probably going to, um, I wouldn't say completely rewrite that principle, we're probably going to make it more specific, though. Um, and now we've thought and done some more work, we can, we can probably improve that principle. And that's the kind of thing that you might do occasionally. Um, do my updates. Um, sometimes uh, things move on, so you do need to update your uh, principle in a more major way. When I first uh, worked with principles back at the BBC, um, one of the principles was buy over build. Um, that's still valid, but now we have software as a service, 
actually rent over buy over build or, or sell over buy over build um, probably makes sense. So, but that's just an evolution of a principle that's already there. Um, that's why um, why principles. And in terms of, of, of why you in the first place, I'm going to look at a slightly odd example example, which has nothing to do with technology, nothing to do with architecture, um, and nothing to do with higher education. Um, I, um, son, plays rugby uh, for a local team, the mighty Emmanuel Lions under 12s, and in fact, I am their head coach. Um, we have a group of six or seven coach, coaches, a fairly stable group of coaches who've been together for six or seven years. We found that we were uh, about the same things again and again and again after, after games. It was a slight element of Groundhog Day. Um, also found that when I was to make decisions about certain things, uh, I didn't know what the guidelines were. I didn't know what the rules were in, to, in terms of, of what a good practice and what I should be doing. So I sat down and wrote a set of principles. And here you can see the manual ends under 12 principles. And for those of you who know the TGAF format very well, you'll very quickly be a spot that these aren't principles in, in a perfectly written format. And, and I don't have, I'm not sad enough to, to have written a, a document to go behind this to explain all of these things. Um, but we've had these for two years. Um, I don't think I've, I've made, I think I made one minor change at the start of this season. Um, it's useful for me. Um, in, I, I send them out to the parents at the start of every season. The parents and coaches know we have them. It gives us a baseline to work from. Um, a couple of them I think are, are particularly important. The, the very bottom about squad selection, um, I'm going to start going into all the competence of uh, selecting uh, select squads but for example we had a cup match yesterday i had to select the squad i was able to use that principle number six to guide the team that we chose um, there are uh, principle number two under competition about prioritizing development and retention over winning that's a really, really important principle um, and something which um, can attract quite the most along with the work selection having these principles written down and defined principle two very clearly what our, what, our, what our enduring rule is um, in that area. When I did these principles, I showed them to someone I know who is a full-time coach for the, uh, for the Rugby Football Union, the, the governing body for rugby in England. He threw them, suggested a couple of changes, really liked the approach. Um, I also showed them to one of the senior coaches in my club, who again, just a couple of improvements, um, but, but liked as well. So now I know that these principles are in line with the way my club runs things and the way the governor runs things. So I have these down, written down, documented, and I know that they, they, they link up. So um, of our architecture, architecture principles in our own workplaces, um, I think a number of, uh, I think that illustrates a number of the, the reasons why architecture principles um, are needed. Um, it avoids groundhog day discussions. Um, I know certainly when I first got to the LSE, we were having quite a few discussions about over build and when you might buy and when you might build. We have a principle that defines that um, and it avoids, it avoids us having the same endless conversations. It is a framework for decision making. Like when I was picking the squad for yesterday's cup game, what's in the principles of your framework for making decision? So uh, if a new requirement comes, should you use SAS? Should we buy it or should we build it? Well, they aren't, the, the principles are very clear. We look to SAS first, we look to applications that we already have first. It gives us a, a clear framework. Um, it's to a single shared understanding. As well as with under 12s, I sent out that line about prioritizing development and retention over winning. Um, everyone knows that. It's, it's clear. When I was the LSE, um, I was talking to someone about, about principle, and I was told that there was an implicit principle of, of in buy of a build, which was about good, because that was going to be in the, the sector principles. I asked if I could see where that was written down or, or to have that backed up. Um, and and, and it turned out wasn't actually noted that written down anywhere. Um, but apart from the best, the best evidence we could find was from a uh, minutes of a meeting in 1999. We had nothing more recent than that. Um, so that's open to all kinds of different interpretations, which is why we want to have a we now have a single clear principle written down. Um, it gives a baseline to identify change over time. I mean, that, that, that does slightly contradict what I said originally about the rules being enduring and seldom changed. But I guess the key there is seldom changed. They do, in some way, they do evolve slowly over time. And again, if you, if you know what the principles are, you identify um, when, how they have changed. And as, as per my conversation with the RFU coach and the club coach, I know the under-12 principles are, are lined up with the, with, um, the organizations that, 
they need to be. Uh, and, and architecture principles at the LA um, are lined up with our organization's objectives and goals and strategies. Um, having architecture principles also helps you to identify when you've got exceptions. In a perfect world, everything would comply beautifully with the architecture principles. I think we all know that that's not the way that real life is. But if you don't know what those principles are, it's hard for you and for other people to know when there's a potential exception. Um, and being a doctor agreed publicized set of principles allows you to identify where there might be exceptions. Uh, the overall architecture process and where architecture principles fit in them. Um, those that know TOGAF will hope remember the architecture development method, um, which is the series of the, the yellow balls going around in a circle, and which takes you through various stages of, of, of developing architecture in an organization, which you can go iteratively. Um, um, phase, and that's where architecture principles fit in. So they, they, they come before um, you do most of the detailed work on your architecture because TOGAF sees them as being fundamental to, to, to um, developing and evolving your, your, your architecture in an organization. So, so they come before um, most other things. So they come before vision, viewpoints, you can do the things on the slides there and slide there. Um, your architecture come before all of those things. So, so they're, they're really a very early activity that you would do before you embed architecture deeply in organization. That is, it's, it's just on the slide. It informs much of the future work. When you have the principles clearly defined, you can then um, use them defining those the things, that vision and viewpoint, and so on, um, as you as you progress your work. I also noted, I think, that writing you write a single set of architecture principles and leave them there. I think there's a value in writing multiple sets of of principles. And the slide illustrates that. This slide you can see in the middle the the, the O that says architecture principles and that that's the main organization architecture principles they're the ones that i introduced well that, that we introduced here uh, about 18 months ago so, um if, well, in a perfect world before, as, a, as a major input to the architecture principles you would have some organization principles um given to you um which uh like which which define the the at an organized strategic level, the vision and um, other key principles of that organization. Now, I would imagine that probably no one has been given a nice, well-formed, well-rounded set of organization principles. Um, in my experience, it's something you have to, um, you have out of documents like, like organized strategies and vision documents and at the departmental mental level as well. Um, you very know them because they're implied because you know the organization that you work in. Uh, uh, so input to the architecture principles um, and then, then as below the architecture principles and complementary to the architecture principles, you can have multiple other sets of principles. So we have a fairly significant uh, CRM pro program on the moment, which is based on Salesforce and we've defined project specific principle for, for that project um, and in fact we haven't gone into great detail defining them eight I think it's eight or ten principles to find and actually it's, it's been really useful having them um, because given us um, a baseline and it's it uh, embedded key things that we want to make sure we're clear at a very early stage we are working on a set of cloud principles at the moment they're about 80 percent drafted I've already mentioned but we're, we're in the LSE we're doing quite a lot of work on that at the moment and it makes to have a just to have a more decent set of principles at a lower level so that's that's something we're doing um probably probably only about a third we have a set of test data principles and that's partly inspired by um gdpr and it's something our our, our information security manager is very keen to see um have a set of data principles um, and we don't yet have to information security principles, but I think are obvious things that, that we need. I was actually looking through my mailbox for an email earlier today, um, and I came across an email from the University of Birmingham that I think had gone out to the to this size enterprise architecture group around data, um, and it looked like it would be a, a very good starting point. Um, I think you'll probably know in your own organisation what areas particularly need development and 
uh, and uh, an order in which you might want to do them. But it's, 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 it's to have more principles at a lower level, which are complementary to the architecture principles. Let's stop the architecture principles getting uh, uh, over bloated and uh, too large. So in terms of how you look to draft the principles, I've already mentioned that you, you look at the organization principles. You might also start with um, any other organization, you know, key terms like a vision, strategy, departmental strategy, drivers, and so on. Um, set number of principles and um, to have a good template that they, they have a good set of draft principles in uh, available online, you just have to Google it. Um, and they, I think, have 20 principles. Um, 16 here at the LSE. Um, I think that's the standard most organizations seem to have, you know, 15, 16, or low 20s. Um, in a poll, I, I, I would like to reduce it to seven or eight, because I think that's much more memorable. But I did try to do that, that work before um, and found that just made that they became very, very high level and you were mixing too many things together and it, it just didn't work really. We have looked into business information and technology, which I think is a, something we've both taken directly from BOGAF. I think they might use application instead of solution. Um, it just helps to group, to group them in terms of maybe more rude or readable. Um, for the main set of architecture principles, so the architecture principles in the middle of this diagram, Program. There is an awful lot out there that you can reuse, or that you can reuse. So there is the TOGAF set of, set of 21 principles. Um, if you just do a quick Google on uh, architecture principles uh, university or, or you know, architecture principles higher education, um, sets from this country and abroad will come up. So there's a very good set. I think it's the first thing that came up when I Googled um, the University of Birmingham. There's a set that comes from um, University, and there are a couple that come up from the states as well, and they're all very good to principles that are um, that you should to uh, either debate on or add them to check yours against. Um, there also, oh, sorry, other sets from other sectors which you may want to, to cross reference against as well, which brings question of um, does the principles need to be specific to, to, to a sector or to the higher education sector? Um, no, not really. The architecture principles that we had at uh, Health, the healthcare organisation I worked for, were very similar to the ones that we had that we have here at the LSE, which in turn are very similar to the ones that we had at the BBC. And it, it isn't just because I've worked in all three organisations; they are all TOEF based and have a lot of. In, in all three of those organisations, it was worth having an enduring rule about versus build. And if you're working in a sector like, say, nuclear power, where you want to have something about safety, and is one of your best principles. For what I've seen, most industries, the principles are pretty, um, are pretty common across the board. Um, the length principles. Um, I mean, that, the length of a given principle very much depends on the space you're using and the fonts and so on. Um, that's the time you use. If, if if I can't write at least of a page, that that probably to me that it likely stack up as a whole substantial principle that's worth its own right. And equally, if I've been going for a, for, for a page and a half to two pages, that for some reason I'm going to too much detail, or maybe it's two principles that I've mixed together, or maybe it's not a principle; it's, it's something else. Just as a rough when you're drafting, um, if you can draft enough or you're drafting way too much, it, it suggests that there's something about your approach that needs to be looked at. If you're onto kind of four, five, six pages for one principle, going into an awful lot of detail, um, and you may want to deal with it in a different way. TERF uh, recommends the format you can see there, um, which I use to a written it seems to work pretty hard. I, I would see no particular reason to deviate from that. Um, so. Uh, so then generally try and make that as um, and snappy as I can, almost like an advertising slogan. Hence, rent over, buy over, build. That's what, five words, uh, and it's pretty easy to remember. Cloud first, two words, that's pretty easy to remember. Um, one of us, the uh, uh, tells a bit 
over long and terms, so no one could recommend it. But I'm so sorry, so no one could remember it. But I haven't been able to reduce those down whilst making them something coherent. Our final, I have a statement, normally a couple of sentences or a couple of paragraphs. Um, elaborate the title and what's meant by it. So rather than just saying rent over buy over build, I don't uh, explain that um, exactly what it what it means. There are no sentences or or a couple of paragraphs on the rationale. So why do we need to say that? Why, why do we need to say rent over over build? What, what point in, in in covering that? Then any number of implicants really. Well, I, I say any any number actually. Um, one of us got up to about 20 implications, and um, to me that's that's not a good thing because we've actually written in a whole load of complicated caveats to deal with various organisation questions. And I actually think the fact that that one has got 20 implications isn't necessarily entirely entirely healthy. I think it's indicative of the fact we need to do some more thinking and work on it. Uh, so you can see now this is this is one of our principles just copied and pasted in. Those of you who know the TOGAF principles will know, will probably recognize this. I think that the title is almost directly one of the principles. Um, and you can see the statement there, it's two sentences, um, and then listed out the implications. So the implications is a good way of saying to people, you know, these are all the things that principle mean that you'll have to think about. There is a question about how much principles should be tied to budget. Uh, uh, the point writing something as an enduring rule if you're never going to be able to do it. There's no point saying, you know, we're going to have gold plated data centers because that's just silly. Um, the rules need, need to show some definite future direction as well. So it's a balance between writing um, things that aren't ambitious. Um, sorry, they don't actually have to be ambitious, but there's, there's a balance between writing uh, things there that are useful and important important and saying things that are never likely to happen and that's something that you have to think about. Um, style needs to be definite. Um, when I write emails and documents I tend to be, if I tend to say we would consider rather than we will or we should do look to, to think about the implications of rather than saying we will. The style for uh, principles should be definite, there shouldn't be any ambiguity. Um, I think Partly it's easy to read and partly so that people do actually mean it. If you write a rule saying we will, we will consider at time looking at something or other, no one take it seriously. Um, so keep it very definite. Be precise as well. Um, terms significant or important and large and small. Um, what is significant? Um, if like that, you're introducing quite a lot of um, ambiguity. Um, if you look on the example of a principle here, on occasion it says we will make efforts to avoid very small piece of plus. Now, obviously, there I've used one of the words, one of the things there I've devised not using. Um, in this context, if you're, if you're looking at ER vendors, small could be, I don't know, they're normally fairly large corporates, le less than 500 employees. Um, if you are looking at an app developer, uh, an app development studio, small could be less than three employees. So, it, it you could in your architecture principles, but I think it would make some of these prints extremely long and extremely unwieldy. Occasionally, you do have to use these terms, but where you can, I think so elsewhere in our architecture principles, I talk about uh, significant projects. Um, and I've actually put it in there of in terms of revenue or strategic importance or, or, or a couple of other things and what we mean by significant. But you need to be careful of terms like that. When you're writing a main set of architecture principles, you are, I would guess you're unlikely to write a brand new principle that no one's thought of. Um, there's quite a lot out there already. Um, and likely you're going to break completely new ground on that. Um, other the principles at a lower level, like the cloud principles that I'm working on at the moment, there is less out there. On this. So we've had to write some of the principles from scratch. Um, and sometimes it's easy to slightly tie yourself up in knots writing something that isn't really a principle. So we had, uh, in an early draft, we had a, a principle which was, the title was, um, 
mine's gone blank now. Um, no organ is too big to fail. So thinking that we need to take steps to make sure that we have and that, that we uh, can deal with any massive failures like that you know, of an Enron type. Expect it, but it happened. But if you think about it, no, no supplier is too big to fail isn't a rule at all. It's a statement, it's true and it's important, it's worth thinking about, but it's not actually a principle. So test any, any new principles that you're trying uh, to just to prove that they are actually a principle. When we thought that, about that one a bit more, we realised that the, the theory is valid, um, but actually it wasn't a low, um, we haven't got a piece of slogan for it yet, a slight, snappy title, but it, it now talks about um, no size too large to fail and therefore we will take steps uh, to make sure that we do that we um, can set up options to, to, other, to, to somewhere a supplier and we, um, there's a third one I can't quite remember. Um, we we find it was valid, we just had to express it a slightly different way. Um, and one idea which, which isn't mine, which, which uh, in fact I saw when I looked at the University of Birmingham's principles, um, they have got their principles reference to their departmental strategy drivers, their IT strategy drivers. So it shows you uh, that where, which of the IT strategy drivers are underpinned by which principles and vice versa. That, that's a good way of checking that all of the strategy drivers are supported by at least one principle and that all the principles support at least one or several um, strategy drivers, which I think is a, is a good way of checking. Um, if your principles were supporting any of the strategy drivers, you, you've got to have a specific principle um, was there. So that's not something we've done, but I think it's a good idea and it's something that we may borrow. Um, so to implement principles, I and mean, this, this partly follows on the one from the slide about drafting them. Um, one, a, a, a draft, I think it's fairly, you want to talk it through with peers to review it. Um, we had several sessions with uh, people in the department. Some people I deliberately spoke to um, to bind the document. If they've had a chance to, to review it at an early stage, I think people are more likely to buy into it. I mean, I suppose that's because they have had, had, had a good input. Um, we also did it uh, by using principles on some of our projects just to think, okay, what would the principles in this situation, how would they have helped? Um, where would the principles maybe not have done what we'd intended them to do? And that's actually quite a good way of, of testing them. Um, you then design a process for them uh, to be used in, in, in real life, so to speak. So that is a really important part of it, and I've, only, I've, I've, I've uh, shown it there in four bullets, which is probably vastly under, under played. You could very easily have a whole or, or several webinars about, about how you govern updates and report on your architecture principles. Um, in terms of you need to govern uh, the principles, but that should hopefully be slow and rare. You need to govern that um, system roadmap and, and views and standards all comply with your uh, You also need to govern that um, state. Um, new systems are in line with your architecture principles as well. And that's a really important process, because if you don't have that, the principles are can very be seen as just some hot air on paper. Equally, you've got to um, about how far you want to go in terms of making the um, principle a kind of command and control type thing versus something that, that you use more to influence. And it depends on your own the role of architecture in the organisation and how much how much you're able to do that. Um, we would want to report our principles as well. Um, in fact, I, I was uh, I was over at, at King's London this morning having a meeting, with, a useful meeting with their architecture team, and they've got a far more evolved process to report on their architecture principles um, than we have. Um, to me, it, it looks really good because it helps you to understand 
how the principles are being used, how they're being complied with, and when they're, they're not being complied with. Um, I thought that the days when an IT department could there and control all, all, all computer power is, is very long gone. Um, and you also have to make sure that you can apply the principles where departments are able to go off and, and own services in the cloud. And that, that's a much harder thing to control. And you have to think about how you might want to influence it then. But equally, if you've got, if you've got principles around security and data, um, those principles are generally just as if not more valid things hosted in the cloud than they are hosted in a, in a, in a data center. Um, but it's hard to find a governance process for. Then, of course, to think about, um, I don't think I would pretend that that was the LSE. Um, it doesn't move quickly in, in, in that area. I don't think anyone would pretend. Um, I had to go to, I think, three different committees to get them approved, and several other people as well, which took a while. Um, however, the advantage of that is that now they are very publicly approved itself but at a high level and people can't really do that and um, formally minuted they are fully and properly approved and that, that that's a, a good thing to have behind us um, and then implementing them the job that needs to be done of communicating that, that's really important people often i think tend to worry about the list of buy of a build or you know what, what are the technical details of cloud principles um you know, basic communication is really important. We had a lunch and learn session in the department that's also set around the technology department. Um, we have made them available online internally so people can get them easily when they need to. Um, I will try and make, make them visible. Uh, so I talk to them about, about, about them a lot. A bit like with the under tolls where I send out the principles every year. Um, if, they're, if they're talked about, people know that they're not just um, something that was written in itself. So, um, I quite a principles quoted at me, and, and that's a good thing. Um, what I saw when I've been in a meeting, particular po point is he used the architecture principles to say the exact opposite back to me. But you know, you know that's that, that's fair enough. It, it's um, fine for the ideas to be challenged like that. Um, but it's really important to, to communicate them and not just about that. Then you the architecture principles. Um, when finding other architecture deliverables to go back to the point about being uh, starting the architecture process, you then use them when you're defining you know, vision and viewpoints and standards and so on. So, so we, and indirectly, we use the principles a lot in in uh, evolving our architecture, and, and they're, they're fundamental to that really. Um, when we look at our portfolio of technology projects across the school, we also think about the architecture principles. Do these double full portfolio, but a collective level and at an individual level, fit in with uh, the architecture principles, the, the enduring rules that it has in it, in it that they have in them. Um, then, I guess, the more complicated process around projects and looking at the in terms of the architecture process. We have a high-level design review, which is rel relatively new. It's something I introduced, I suppose, probably a year ago, because we hadn't, didn't have anything that did that. But to be honest, I'm too late in the day to be doing a proper evaluation against your architecture principles. For us, that process comes after a business case has been signed off, after the solution has been agreed. So the ability to at that stage is actually very limited. So for me, that's not the right place to govern the architecture print. Um, and they are looking at introducing what we're trying to change, a conceptual review. So sometime between the business case, I guess for those of you who have mandates or something similar, um, around out there, and that will look at the proposal um, in the life principles. And that, that's a good time to, to influence and change when, the, when there is something around the idea, but it isn't all completely baked in. Um, and then there's needed around where projects either want to or have breached the architecture principles. Um, most, I think probably most of the pro significant projects we have will breach one or two principles in a minor way. Um, that happens and, that, and that's real life. Um, I think it's important to identify that and acknowledge that. Um, there will be projects that want to breach principles in, in much more significant ways. And that's when you need an, a, a, a well-defined exemptions process. Um, should they be allowed? Should they not be allowed? Who makes this 
Mm, if a you know, price tag of tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds for that, it can be very hard to argue against. It. And that's why having the approval um, and buying from stakeholders as well is, is very important. You need to have a process around that and think about how that will be managed. Um, our architecture principles are governed by our architecture board. We have a new architecture board, um, and any significant breaches go to the architecture board to be considered. Um, I think that's of our own architecture principles that we can prove um, after the projects and, and the principles can be can, could be made there. Um, and then we also own our principles as well. So any changes or updates have to go through the architecture board and be signed off. So at the start that I wasn't going to go through our principles in detail, and I'm going to keep that. There are our architecture principles. I think those of you who know TOGAF will recognize quite a lot in here and, and that's kind of going to our part like you know, as I said there are sorts of principles probably two or three that attract the most attention are I mentioned number nine rent over buy over build several times um, that's a lot of retention common actors for a common purpose um, or, um, that's a complicated one because while as an architect that's what we want. We also have to recognise where things are different, and maybe might actually need a, a different application. And at the bottom, cloud first, where we're doing a lot of work on that um, at the moment. And actually, if you look at these architecture principles, most don't really go into any technologies. Technology is really starts to creep, creep in at the end when we're looking at cloud first. So disadvantages or pitfalls. Um, it's documentation to write. It's something else that has to be edited, circulated, maintained. Kept up to date, um, than that. Um, as I said, if you have a 20 architecture document, which we do, will anybody ever actually bother to read that? Um, people in, the, in my own department will read it, and um, it affects them on uh, a basis. Um, people out who aren't technologists won't get it. Um, I would expect them to, so I would expect to, as well as our 20th page document, to have a shorter deck that's probably you know, a few slides long at most and explains it in modern but non technical language for people who aren't technology and don't want to get into the detail of it. And that needs to convey principles matter and what differentiates to them. Several so times about the need for governance process, uh, and that's, you know, that's more rules and more. more Bureaucracy and, and the principles themselves are a set of rules. Um, you could argue you know, uh, uh, it's another thing to constrain people, um, which you know there, there is some truth in truth in that. Equally, you could argue that the rules actually make it easier for people to um, do things because they know exactly where the rules are, um, and the, and um, while to respect them, it, it means clarity about what the rules are, and they're not having to check and guess. Um, in some ways, you could argue the principles maybe state the obvious. We've got first one says um, these changes are driven by requirements and benefits. You know that's not really a statement that set the world on fire. Um, but having said that, it's actually really useful having that statement at the implication documented. Certainly, when I arrived, there was a variable standard of requirements, particularly in terms of non-functional requirements. Um, a few projects didn't have, didn't have those. Um, it's now clearly documented that all projects must have them, um, and that's actually really useful to have down on um, the paper. As I said, it's an overhead to maintain. So, you know, um, it's writing the documents, but there's no point just writing the documents and firing it off. Um, it then needs to be maintained and governed and updated. So really, um, to wrap up before we move on to questions and comments, um, to know more about architecture principles, I've, I've talked several times about TOGAF Chapter 23. Um, slides will be available, so you can just hopefully click on the link. Uh, although, frankly, you can Google it very easily. I mentioned other institutions which have their principles available online, the University of Birmingham, Plymouth, um, also Loyola University in, uh, in Chicago, in the States, and there are, there are quite a few others out there as well. Um, does have some information about print, um, but not that much. I have a few specific examples for those of you who um, should have to Gartner. Um, um, able to look at what they've got, but I wouldn't go to it as a major for principles. I would imagine that from their perspective, they probably 
probably have realized Telegraph have done a good job, so they don't need to um, spend too much on it. And later I had, as I was as I was writing these these, these slides, um, I had to write principles that sometimes suit around data and our information security, um, and it would be better if I didn't have to start with a blank page. Um, it would be lovely if I could uh, use it to a thriller people have done to put together uh, a straw man, or, and I could then cross-reference it. Um, and it's to me, there may well be other people on this webinar who are in a similar position, who maybe have to write cloud principles or test data principles, or uh, I guess it might be better if someone's written them. And if there's a way that we could um, do uh, share those principles and have some kind of repository or central exchange, um, one thing being new to the sector that's really good about it is that people talk to each other and they collaborate, like this webinar, like the, the visit I had one to Kings. Um, and if possible, it would be able to share those principles. Uh, but I don't know if there's a way that we could do that. Um, I know that Ian Anderson isn't, hasn't been able to be on this call, but maybe something else to take up with him. So that's everything I wanted to say about, about principles. I'm just going to see if I can work the technology and I'll have a quick drink and then we can look for questions and comments. Right, so now I'm looking at chat. Um, there are no questions through at the moment, although it's quite possible that I'm looking in the, in the wrong place. Um, no, far. Okay, so if you've got any questions or comments, um, please let me know and for another minute or two. And if there aren't any questions or comments, we can go back to our day live. Wait to see if any comments come in. If anyone's interested, the under tours lost yesterday. Uh, eight, one, unfortunately. Um, so, question, couple, couple of questions or questions through. When handling groups of principles, how do you handle conflicts? Um, that's a good. Um, I guess the way that you would approach uh, conflicts generally. There is no golden rule with principles around resolving conflicts. Um, having a governance process that's clear helps with that. Um, yeah, conflicts. You will always get. You know, I've had a lot of discussions about. You know, someone will want to say build a software, and, I, and my, that conflict that goes against one of our architecture principles. Then their point is, well, it's going to cost cost me money and take me longer. Um, why do that just to comply with architecture principles? Is the kind of thing you you can get. Um, I think that's. Just it's about explaining to people that overall there are there are there are benefits. Um, if there are, are agree, it may be useful to take them through uh, the exceptions process so that that's considered by the architecture board, which they will feel is a considered and fair process. Um, and that's something I think that as an architect you have to evaluate on on a basis. I think I think one of the benefits of principles is that they are more open and more um, transparent. Um, and thing. Um, another question has just come through. It's just gone off the screen. If you can give me a second. Um, you've not. Read it. Is there any reason, reason for that? Uh, no, not really. Um, to me, uh, architect principles are very sorry. Uh, yeah, architect principles are very much uh, an enterprise architecture um, thing, so, and, and they are. Enterprise architecture is that it's hard about linking what your organisation wants to do with technology, and principles are absolutely fundamental in that. So, I, I get a large extent when I've been talking about architecture, I've been meaning enterprise architecture. Um, to have, have a role in, in areas like SNA architecture or, or, or data architecture, but from at their heart, um, architecture principles are, 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 are a part. A core part of architecture principles. In fact, I think one of the earlier slides, um, the Clograph definition, they, that they are fundamental to the development of architecture of enterprise architecture. And that was from Richard Maccabee. Thank you, Richard. Um, and now one for our Nick Sharrett. Um, in any, have you found any particular good way to get engagement with um, developers and research groups? Um, Something we've got involved with, and um, through the principles to 
um, um, we have a new director of our department um, and I think we are going to be reorganizing and I think we are going to be changing the way that we work with, with um, to the wider organization and that, that, that's a good thing I think we'll engage with them in a slightly different way um, and I think that's going to include the kind of thing um, that, that's mentioned in that question around getting engagement from from developers research groups um, not something that we've particularly um, worked through with the principals at um, this stage next question from Richard Maccabee do you have any lessons to share about using the principles with non-IT colleagues, gaining by, etc. Um, number one, don't give them a long document. Number two, thought is don't give them documents with technical terms in. Um, number three would be give them the so What does it mean to them? So why do they need to care about this? Potentially, what they feel is a fairly tedious document for technology department. Um, so you explain to them what this matters to them and why this will help them. Um, it will help them to give them clarity about what kind of principles, I'm sorry, what kind of um, things they need to do. If they're going out to buy a solution, this will tell them um, that we look towards trust. Now, hopefully that's something they would do in partnership with us anyway. Um, so it's um, a separate communication to uh, deaf people. Um, I have been taught some of our, what we call systems who vary in how technical they are and obviously I've amended what I said according, you know, according to the people I'm talking to. Some want to get right into the technicalities, some absolutely don't want to. And it's partly about knowing your audience as well. Um, Nick. So if a big case suggests something which breaks the principle, it probably ignores something. E.g. future support costs, compliance, risk, etc. Yeah, I would I would agree with you on that. Um, I had a conversation with someone recently. Um, um, so they wanted to be related to GDPR, um, and their option was considerably cheaper than the one the architecture principles would mandate. Um, and the reason why was because it had left off a whole load of stuff around um, some back end costs and and well, based around integration. Um, um, in general, that's an interesting thought. If something's breaking a principle, is it missing, is it ignoring something? Um, I haven't thought that in detail, but it may well be true. I think an example where its principles were breached in a fairly significant way, it would actually be, that would be true. I'll ponder that one a bit more though, but I think, yeah, I think that may well be true. Um, another question, GDPR arriving this year, do you feel that a cloud phone principle may need to be re revisited, especially in the area of data processor agreements. That's from Justin Burt at UIL. So with Gerard this year, do you feel that a cloud first principle may need to be revisited, especially in the area of data processor agreements? Um, I have got into data processor agreements in detail. And GDPR isn't making us to think our cloud, and I'm thinking of conversations I've had with our information security manager. What I'm trying to do, especially with our cloud principles, is to, is to make our approach more open and clearer so that the roles that people have under, and under GDPR as well are properly thought through. And GDPR doesn't deploy things out, but it does mean that we have to do it slightly differently. And so, uh, we have, as I know, made particular for that. Um, maybe something that's happened implicitly as, as GDPR is arriving very soon and I've had a load of conversations with our information security manager I kind of think that that may be reflected or read our principles um, the other thought in the back is I should probably go away and check um, okay we've had a number of questions I don't know if there are any more last questions that people want to ask if we will Call to the message through to say that's all the questions. Um, for your time, I hope that was useful. Um, I think probably people said at the start, people who have um, a lot of exposure to principles, this recap on things you already know, but hopefully for people who are newer to principles, um, they've given things away. Otherwise, um, let's say let's finish 10 minutes early um, and you can have 10 minutes on your.
Thanks very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Goodbye.